Hi, I'm Corey Nathan, and this is Talking Politics and Religion Without Killing Each Other. You're home for edifying, provocative, and fun conversations among high-profile public figures and regular folks like me. We talk about faith and politics and all kinds of topics that really matter in our culture. So if you're tired of all the screamers out there taking all the oxygen out of the room and you want to join us and taking some of that space back, you'll love talking politics and religion without killing each other. Thanks for spending some time with us. Enjoy today's show. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We are talking politics and religion without killing each other. I am your host, and I'm so grateful to have a chance to talk about religion and politics and faith and all kinds of big ideas in our culture with all kinds of interesting, accomplished folks of goodwill in good faith. And I'm really excited to announce that it's easier than ever to find us and join our community and perhaps support us. And that's on politicsandreligion.us. The end is spelled out, Andy, politicsandreligion.us. Check it out. That will really help us continue to have conversations like the one we're having today. Uh, So I usually just like launch right into my guest, but I have to ask our guest before I even introduce her, uh, what does it mean to be a multi-genre theologian? (laughs) (laughs) So one of my favorite theologians, Dr. Catherine Keller, um, gave me that uh, descriptor. And I have uh, used it ever since. It's such an honor for someone like Dr. Keller to even know me. Um, But ultimately, being a multi-genre theologian is that I am doing work, doing theological work in various spaces, not just in the academy, um, not just in church, but in pop culture spaces, in entertainment spaces, just always trying to think critically about the way we see God and the way we see each other based on how we see God. Yeah. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense because of the person who introduced me to you. You can say that about uh, Professor Carter, J. Cameron Carter. Oh, I am a J. I, I am a J. Cameron Carterian. <laughs> I took all of his classes at Duke. I love, 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 love him. So yeah, I consider myself a J. Cameron Cartierian. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've told this story uh, on this podcast before, but my introduction to Professor Carter, um, before we got into the scripture or the Bible, what have you, we spent we spent 45 minutes talking about Naima, uh, Coltrane's composition mm-hmm. and Coltrane's collaboration with, with Thelonious Monk. And uh, it was perfect because it was on the body of Christ, the concept of the yep. body of Christ and making yeah. those similarities of virtuosity within uh, certain confines. But, you know, or or and, and then I remember how he ended his lesson too. Uh, he, he ended his talk like it had the the uh, little bits of uh, Hauerwas in it where he uh-huh. said all this theologizing doesn't mean anything when your grandmama's in the hospital. <laughs> so mm-hmm. yeah. so multi-genre theologian. Anyway, okay. So now the introduction, now that I know a little bit about uh, multi-genre <laughs> theologian, Candace Marie Benbo is a multi-genre theologian who was named by Sojourners as one of 10 Christian women shaping the church in 2020. Candace has written for various outlets, including Essence Magazine, Glamour Magazine, The Root, Vice, Shondaland, Madame Noir, and the Me Too movement. Actually, that makes so much sense. You look at the how the diverse portfolio of publications you're showing up in, multi-genre Thank makes you. so much sense. And it, really importantly, and something that's really just been in my noggin for the last month, I've been reading Convergent Books, just published uh, Candace's first book, Red Lip Theology for church girls who've considered tithing to the beauty supply store when Sunday morning isn't enough. Candace holds degrees from Tennessee State University, North Carolina Central University, and Duke Divinity School, one of my favorites. And she is involved in numerous charitable organizations, including one she founded in her mother's memory, the Louise Marie Foundation, focusing on faith and education. The foundation supports HBCU nursing students provides micro grants for community mental health projects and creates opportunities for spiritual growth and development. And I didn't even get into the half of it, but uh, <laughs> I could go on forever t- telling folks about you, Candace Marie, Benbo, thank you so much for joining me. 
How Thank you, doing? you for having me. I'm good. I'm really, really good. It's been a it's been a good day, a long day, but a good one. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Well, I hope this is uh, this is a just a fun, engaging conversation, and and not not too much work. But I might make you work. I hope maybe I'll make you think or something. I don't know. Or maybe you make me think, or maybe we do it for Let's each other. Let's do it. Yeah. Let's do it, man. So so I, like I, I before I hit record, I said you know it's kind of unfair because I feel like I've gotten to know you so well from reading your articles and now your book. And and but you don't know me. So but I do want to ask you as a theology theologian and a, and a writer, you're already so prolific. But I, I imagine you as a little girl, uh, like a four or five year old mm-hmm. Candace raising her hand in any given context and saying, I have something to say. So my yeah. question is, how early in life was it that you recognized this inner voice that has questions and thoughts that you wanted to offer up to the world? So my mother would say it was when I was 18 months old and she had been working second and third shift as a nurse. And I was used to spending the night with my grandmother and my grandfather. And this particular day, she did not have to work. So she made breakfast for me. And it was a continental breakfast of a bagel, Danish, and fruit. But I was used to breakfast at my grandparents' house, which was this full smorgasbord of of Southern (laughs) breakfast cuisine. And at 18 months old, she said, I sat at the table, I looked at the food, and I said, Mama, what the hell is this? (laughs) And... (laughs) and (laughs) And she she asked me again. She said, what did you just say? <laughs> and she said, I repeated it. Mama, what the hell is this? <laughs> and she went in the room and she called my grandmother. And my grandma said, well, what is it? <laughs> and she told her what she cooked me. And so I, my mother would say, as well as my grandmother would say that that was the earliest. And since they tell me that memory, I think that from that time on, I had no problem speaking my mind, even when it got me in trouble. And I had no problems asking hard questions, even when they got me in trouble, too. (laughs) Yeah. 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 That that relationship with your mom, I just imagine that her patience with you and her faithfulness to you was what part of what gave you the space to be bold in your assertions, but also to create that oxygen for you to ask those questions of yourself and of big concepts, right? Absolutely. You know, I, um, I grew up in a home of books and I grew up in a home with a mother who loved learning, who loved reading, um, who told me that the most important cards I would ever have in my life are a library card and a voter registration card. And so I was always pushed to think critically. Um, I was always pushed to not ask for the answer, but to do my own research to seek and find out the answer. And so I, my mom really instilled these, these ideals of critical thinking and study, rigorous study, and an appreciation for learning, and an appreciation for discovery in me. And, you know, I, as most people, uh, children, um, applied it in ways that she may not have necessarily thought were, uh, I would, but she really was the foundation for how I understood and understand myself as a Black woman and how I come to realize who I am to be in this world. And yet, and yet she did say the three things a lady must never speak about in public is sex, religion, and politics. You'd speak a lot on all those things. So (laughs) that was, I mean, I think that was the funniest thing growing up is that I was taught, you know, a lady and she would say it like this, there are three things <laughs> that a lady never speaks about in public. And you rarely speak about it in private. 
And I'm like, okay. Now, mind you, this is very interesting because my mother took me to political protests and rallies. So we talked about politics publicly. She took me to, um, like, I, I went, I saw her vote when I was, a, she, she would take me every time she voted. And so I saw my mother's political leanings. I saw how she lived that out. I saw my mother's activism work and community work. And, and so, and I saw her have those conversations publicly. <laughs> and so it was, so of course I never heard her talk about sex and and her faith was central to who she was and was was central to how she raised me the very interesting thing though is she raises this this daughter who is so extremely vocal who who wants to have the conversations that nobody wants to have and who believes that it's important to talk about these things. And so she, you know, raises this, I, I'm not even gonna call it the antithesis of what she of what she wanted, but I definitely heard her say that and was like, oh, hold my beer. Like I'm definitely <laughs> going to have the conversations that you that will make your hair raise and and I did um I didn't shy away from having them around her I didn't shy away from having them in her earshot and so you know I she always would say to me that's the risk of raising free children and even when it was frustrating for her I think she just really honored that she wanted to raise a free kid like she wanted a child who, especially a Black girl, who knew that her mind was something that was special and powerful and didn't feel like she had to, in any way, shape, or form, acquiesce to, to powers and structures that wanted to diminish her light. And so, yeah, like, I think that's the greatest gift that, sh that we actually gave each other in that respect. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds like there were very, very few times where she really asserted a, a strong objection to something that you were doing. Uh, some, sometimes there were different, it, it sounds like sometimes there were differences of opinion, but she was of the mindset of like, Hmm, let me get some popcorn. Let's see how that's going to work out. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Like, I mean, I think as I got older, it was like, look, she going to say what she wanted to say. I'm going to say what I wanted to say. And she knew that I wasn't going to change my mind. You know, like there, there could be this level of frustration, of course, but my mom really gave me room to blossom. Mm. And I tell people like, I, I you get, you get a red lip theology because of my mother and not in spite of her, right? That like, there are some, there are some people who have had to pursue dreams without the support of parents. And that's a very different motivating space than when you do it with the support of parents, even if they one, don't understand it fully, or to agree, right? Like that there were there were ways that we differed theologically, but my mom told me I could be anything I want to be in this world. And whatever path I chose, she was behind me 110%. And so that you get real of theology because I had her overwhelming support. And it was because she was so supportive. It was because she pushed me that I was able to really flourish and thrive in the ways that I have. Yeah, yeah. Now, I'm, th there's a lot that I want to talk specifically about red lip theology. Uh, but before we get to that, it, it was uh, partly your mom and I think a mentor of your mom's that recognized in you a future in something sociological or what, yeah. what was that? Uh, pastor McDowell, my mother's pastor. My wife's maiden oh. name, by the way, is McDowell. So, oh wow! I don't know so if there's cool. any relation, but yeah, <laughs> yeah. She, um, he told he told my mother that I was going to be a social scientist, 
And my mom was like, what in the heck is a social scientist? Because she was, she was a nursing major and she stayed in the nursing building. And so she was like, she told me what was so funny was that she was like, I did, she took her general sociology course that she had to take require. And then she went back to the, to the nursing building. And so when I decided that I wanted to pursue social science, it really tickled her because it was a prophecy come to life that, you know, I was this little kid and this man told her, you know, that, that I would be a social scientist. And I really come alive thinking through, you know, both of my degrees in sociology and and in theology and like sitting at that, that intersection has been really where I've been able to thrive. Yeah. Yeah. Now you did a lot of education even before getting to Duke. You said at one point I went to Duke with a number of questions born out of, born out of my work as a sociologist and out of the death of Whitney. <laughs> so first of all, can you explain that to me? But also, um, what were some of those questions that you were grappling with? Wow. So a lot of the questions that I had were really born out of this idea of what it means to resist the notion that you can't have questions, <laughs> that that you have to take faith wholesale, that the ways that you are structured to be this Christian woman, Christian girl, um, are to be accepted wholesale, that you know, this kind of these, one, these notions of uh, the politics of respectability, this idea of what it means to be holy and pure and chaste, that you have to live into those in order not only to just be in right relationship with God, but to be in right relationship with your community. And what's honest, Corey, is that so much of my questions were rooted in how disconnected from myself I felt when I was trying to live into those models and molds. And if that is the case, if living into these models and molds of who the church is telling me that I'm supposed to be keeps me connected from myself, thus keeping me connect disconnected from the one who actually created me, then how true, authentic, and genuine can these situations be? You see what I'm saying? And so I, I struggled. I struggled with that. And, and I watched it in Whitney. Like, to me, she was the ultimate church girl. Like, she presented, as we were taught that we are supposed to, born and raised in the church, beautiful, had an amazing voice, an amazing gift. When you heard her sing, you felt God, right? And then you watched these kind of public struggles become, become I mean, these private struggles became public. And as church people tend to do, you got the, oh, she knows better. Uh, there was this kind of distancing from her that happened and then you saw the entire public downward spiral and I saw that with so many of my friends who were in church maybe had a baby and weren't married maybe got in trouble in school maybe got in trouble outside of school made a made a mistake or did something that people didn't necessarily that didn't or genuinely reflect who they were and people shunned them talked about them and when Whitney died I really felt like where is the hope for the rest of us how how can we ever outlive the church's hold in that way and so that's what really pushed me to go to seminary mm. to think through particularly from the perspective of a young millennial black woman what does it mean to think differently about my relationship with God? 
What does it mean to think differently about my relationship with myself? And how, how can both be more holistic and how can both be more genuinely authentic and generative and not really like marred in a very kind of retributive justice model that does not give me room to really grow. Yeah, at one point, that so much is making sense because, it, and, and this has so many different overlapping threads as part of this fabric. At, at one point in the book, you were talking about Leviticus and First Corinthians, and, and why am I taking the words out of those books? I think you were talking about marriage and, and um, sexual identity, mm-hmm. but your views about how to see those books or see how to interpret scripture, how to be in the world, how to be a creature of God, a, a child of God, God, one that God loves uh, and delights in. When I first read that that sentence, I was like, ooh, it was, it was um, disconcerting. Mm. But then I, I just kept reading and, and it sounds like you wrestled through some of this stuff too, not just in at Duke, but beyond Duke. And as you mm-hmm. found your voice and continued to grapple with some of these things. Yeah, no, I, I, I see where this is integrative. Again, going back to the, um, how do we call it? Uh, a, a multi-genre theologian? <laughs> so, yeah, a multi-genre theologian. It, it just shows up. It's not just theoretical. It shows up yeah. in relationship with, with our, our friends, in relationship with family, in relationship with people we go to church with and do work with. Right. That makes so much sense. Yeah, I mean, I mean, the the personal has always been political. The personal is public and the personal is theological, right? So so I e then the the theological is public and personal and relational. And and it matters to think through how you view yourself in light of what you believe because how you view yourself is going to determine how you engage with other people and how other people engage with you and at some point I and other people have had to be very honest about the very skewed way we've seen ourselves and thinking that seeing ourselves that way did a service to God and did a service to our faith when in actuality it did a disservice. Mm. And we have had to, we have the scars to prove it. And relic theology is one part acknowledging those scars, but it's also a part of telling people that it's possible for the scars and the wounds to heal and that you can live into a very different articulation of your faith. Wow. Well, I'm, I'm going off. I had so many prepared questions, but you're making me go off script now. <laughs> so addressing, acknowledging those scars, addressing those scars, you, you have talked openly in other interviews about grief and how Mm -hmm. your relationship with grief has has evolved over the last six plus years since your mom died Mm -hmm. you also have written here recently in in some articles i've read on mental health and have shared resources and stuff i don't know if you want to talk about this personally but maybe sociologically how are we doing how are we as a culture how are we doing from a mental health perspective Mm, um, not well. Not well. What what is true is that um, we were not doing well in the ways that we addressed mental health, grief, and wellness prior to the pandemic. And what the research is saying is that it has only worsened during the pandemic. Um, and why is that you think because we're i well dr uh monica coleman i just did a i've, I've 
I just did a story a few weeks ago for the Grio where I where I'm the daily um, lifestyle education and health writer. And Dr. Monica Coleman is the author of Bipolar Faith. And she is um, she's an ordained AME preacher and a professor of African American studies at the University of Delaware. And she said, part of what's happening is that people have always maintained and sustained their wellness in community. And when community has been taken away from so many people and does not look the way that it used to and probably never will again, when you did not already have those resources and you depended on community to sustain you and now it looks fundamentally different. You are in a um, circumstance and a situation that is dire. And so that is one part of it. For me, as it relates to faith, we have not had honest, good, healthy conversations around mental health in the majority of church spaces. Mm. So I was a part of the minority having a mother who was deeply Christian, deeply faithful, and was also a mental health um, nurse practitioner. I grew up hearing things like you need God and every qualified professional to be your best self because my mom worked in mental health, I would take Prozac pens and Wellbutrin notebooks to school because she was like, I'm not buying notebook paper. Like, <laughs> I, you gotta like, go get one of those notebooks. <laughs> and, so, and so wellness and mental health were normalized for me in a very different way. When I heard sermons that demonized mental health, my mother quickly corrected it at home. So I grew up knowing that God wanted me to be well. And I grew, and which made it easier when my mother passed for me to say I wasn't okay and go to counseling and get a therapist. A lot of people have not had that. They've heard you can shout it away, just shout, just pray. We say in our community, fake it till you make it. And that is not healthy, right? So today at work, I wrote about Black women and high-functioning depression in response to the former Miss USA, Chesley Christ, Christ who um, died by suicide at the, at the beginning of the, over the weekend. Um, and her mother took to social media to tell everyone that her daughter had been you know, dealing with and navigating high functioning depression. And so many of us do. Yeah. And we don't tell anybody. We just go through the motions and we keep going. And part of my commitment to one being transparent about my journey and my commitment to my own wellness is because I know that there are people who grew up in a faith context like mine who didn't have the resource of a mother like I did yeah who didn't have those those sermons and those quotes pushed back against in their home and they genuinely are fighting to be well and they need to see that it's possible so I'm hopeful in some regards and in some respects that that the narrative or the tide, I should say, is changing around how we talk about it. But we still have a very, very long way to go, especially in church. I think that's totally fair. You know, the, when I first grappled with the possibility of um, depression, uh, I was subsequently diagnosed with uh, clinical ma manic depression or uh, bi mm -hmm. uh, bipolar I, I had maybe five or six years into after becoming a Christian and I was going to a church that uh, they were very dismissive of the whole mm -hmm. field of psychology, that it's all a sin issue. Mm -hmm. Some of my more 
empathetic or, or sympathetic uh, brothers and sisters at church uh, said those platitudes, well, put it at the Lord's feet and, you know, that kind mm -hmm. of thing. And I'm just thinking, what the fuck does that mean? Like exactly. when I exactly. get up and it's like, I'm walking through thick sand. If, even if I can get out of the bed, like mm -hmm. what, what in the world does that mean? Yeah. Um, but I, I, you know, I, to be honest, I still, I still wrestle with that. Like that, that is kind of lingering in my noggin. Like, yeah, I mean, it does. Like we, I, I tell people all the time, we serve, we follow a a man and have patterned our life after a man who at the mo one of the most vulnerable moments of his life prayed until he dropped sweats of blood. Yeah. That is anxiety all day. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like yeah. that like that that there is when we when we read the scriptures with a critical level of graciousness, not just for ourselves, but for the humanity that that Jesus embodied, we find we find permission to be honest and even more open about the conditions that all of us face, right? That like, it's not just pray it away, you yeah. know? Like I, I am somebody who functions with a severe and high level of anxiety. I had that before my mother passed, but her death exacerbated it. Mm. And an unexpected passing in the way she did made it even more debilitating, right? That there are days where I, if something happens, I go from here to the worst case scenario in like five seconds. Like we're in my office right now. I'm talking to you on my iMac. I literally have a, have four breathing exercises taped to my Mac, to my iMac and right beside it centering bible verses <laughs> like that like it matters that we recognize that it takes all of it right to manifest our wellness and every other wednesday i meet with my therapist yeah. you know um that th it it is the greatest responsibility of my life to um, steward my wellness. And I've had to learn in these last six years that I can't allow anything to, to shake me out of it because I know, even if no one else does, I know how quickly I can, I can, but it can become a very precarious and dangerous space for me. Yeah. So my responsibility is to steward it and steward it well, right? Um, part of that, as you said earlier, was navigating a relationship, a healthier relationship and understanding of grief. Grief for me is not an adversary. Like, and I see people who talk about, who talk very openly about how much they like say grief is a bitch. Like I hate grief. Da, 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 da. Like I could not and cannot afford to see grief in that way. One, because it jeopardizes my own wellness, right? Like I had to see with that same critical graciousness that I talked about earlier, I had to see grief the same way. Grief would rather not be in my life. <laughs> Grief would much rather my mother be here. Grief would much rather that I not experience the, the painful things that I did that broke me. Grief is here, one, to, to remind me that there was a time where all was not broken and all was not sad. Right. And grief is here to remind me that I don't travel alone. Right. That there are ways that there are ways that the 
the love that I had, that I lost, the people that I lost, the, that they still travel with me, that, that the experiences, grief, grief is a constant companion. And we've had to learn how to journey, and we're still learning how to journey together, right? There are some days where grief is a pronounced sorrow. And there are some days where while grieving, I still am able to find joy and happiness at a memory of my mother, right? At a memory of days long gone. That's still, that is all part of it, right? But I had to move from a space where I didn't see grief as an adversary, but that grief was this beautiful, complicated, companion with me companion and and we are learning how to do life together because there will not be a time that I am without grief and there will not be a time that grief is grief is without Candace like we we have had to we are having to figure out how to do this together and not only do it in a way that reflects the the honesty and the truth of my experiences, but also do it in a way that enables me to steward my wellness in a space in a way that allows me to to maintain it, to maintain my wellness as I grieve, as I go through the ebb and flow of whatever emotions come. Yeah. Um. Um, your your publisher is going to be really pissed at me that it's taken us about forty minutes or so to get into red lip theology. <laughs> they don't care, I, and I'm, and if they say something to you, then you call tell them to come talk to me. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, I do want to ask you about that because I, I I forget off the top of my head, but um, there was a story that you share when that phrase occurred to you. It was like you were in an argument. And and you were you were winning the argument, but then you got to a point, if I remember correctly, where you got stumped. And it's just like more by inspiration than anything. Th- this phrase so what, is that what happened? Yeah. Okay. No. So what happened was we had this issue in one of our classes where the part of Duke requires that you take a Black Church Studies course in order to graduate, and the majority of the white classmates didn't want to and there was always this tense moment in class and so after a moment in class where one of our classmates said that Howard Thurman the great mystic needed to be disciplined against um early church uh historians and theologians like we, like all the black kids, black students in class bristled at the fact of this white kid, this white student saying that this black man need to be disciplined by disciplined against what these white men were saying <laughs> about theology and about God. And so I go into the library and I see one of the classmates and I'm just like, oh God, like I know He's going to come out and he's going to come over and talk to me because I have been intentionally avoiding him since class. So he comes to my table. And if I would have gotten up, it would have been very clear that I was getting up because he sat down and it would have just been really ugly. (laughs) So, (laughs) So he sits down and he says, Candace, let me ask you a question. I'm just like, here we go. And I said, yes. <laughs> and he said, do you consider yourself a Black theologian or are you a regular theologian? And I mean, it was the audacity for me. Like the, the fact that somehow the work that we do in Black liberation theology and womanist theology in any intersectional the, uh, theological space is somehow not regular yeah (laughs) and 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 so there was this moment where I was like okay I could say something or I could let it ride and it just popped in my head that day I was like I'm a red theologian and he said 
who who was that? Who who created that? And I said, I did just now. And then I got my stuff and I left. <laughs> and ironically, when I said it, it made all the sense in the world to me. Um, because it really was, and the more that I formulated it and the more I sat with it, it really was the way in which I understand the world around me and faith as a black millennial woman of faith. And it has been able to give me tools to introduce myself back to God and, yeah. and me back to myself in ways that are much more loving and holistic. But it's funny because it came out of a moment where I was just like, yeah what am I going to say to this dude? And I said it and it was like, this is it. <laughs> so it's holistic. It's, it's, mm -hmm. um, you know, I think somewhere else you talk about, you know, you, you are black, you are a woman, you are a Christian mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and any one of these, um, ingredients of who you are as a mm -hmm. whole person isn't, doesn't reduce your Christianity or doesn't reduce your womanhood. And strange as this might sound, I think that's where I related to you the most. And what was one of the most profound things for me is when you talk about how, how God sees, because God sees all of that at the same time, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I am a Jew yeah. and I am a Christian, not a mm -hmm. Jewish Christian or what, I don't know what mm -hmm. kind of labels you want to, and I'm a yeah. Nathan and I'm a Mets fan and I'm a, you know, all these yeah. things at the same time. And God can hang with that, you know? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. We 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 live at the the point of so many intersections. Yeah. And the danger is not, I would argue, not in the identity. The danger is in how we wield the power that may come with certain identities to harm other people the value that we place in certain identities, the value that we that we deny certain identities, um, the abilities that we give some and don't give others, that kind of power is the problem. But but yeah, like I am as Christian as I am as as I am black as I am woman. That those things don't get parsed out from me. And they're not supposed to. They are they are fundamentally who I am. So, okay. I, I wanted to ask you about this because it, it's something, honestly, that I've been wrestling with, not mm -hmm. just this year, last year, but the last 20 years. Um, mm -hmm. In your chapter, Suing God for Back Child Support, I think it's the first place in the book where you begin to talk about gender. And uh, one thing you say that, that was pretty convicting, you said, I can no longer unsee the danger in assigning gender to God. Beyond just saying God is a man, assigning the male gender to God potentially shapes how we, especially Black ch uh, Christians, see all men. So uh, you've already begun teasing this out a bit, but if you could tease that specific thing out a little bit more, and, but, and, and also what kinds of implications does assigning gender to God have in our society historically and today? I mean, it is the root of patriarchal structures and sexism, right? Um, and heteronorm heteronormativity. Like when we are when we are assigning maleness to God, we are assigning and ascribing a certain kind of power to maleness. And those who who have maleness in in a certain context and in a certain community are considered and viewed powerful, right? And so the problem then becomes, what then does that power do, right? How, how, do, we, how, how do we justify the ways that men are given a certain, that men are inherently seen as leaders, that men are inherently seen as those who should automatically be believed and listened to, um, that men are inherently seen as the ones who must give and should give the directives and authority and power. That does something <laughs> for how you construct community, 
because it does not foster communalism, right? It doesn't, it doesn't foster the belief and, and the reality that everyone can lead, that everyone has a voice and that everyone matters. For me, and I talk about this, I talk about this in the book, that moving away from gendering God, working to ungender God, restored so much of God's holiness and majesty to me, right? Like I did not want to continue, like there was something, even, and, and there are people, and I still have a I Met God, She's Black shirt and I love wearing it. <laughs> and there are some people who who refer to God with, with she, her pronoun, pronouns. There are people who refer to God with they, them pronouns. For me, I did not want the same force, the same light and divinity that guides my life, that I believe created the vastness of this world and this universe. I didn't want to describe that power with the same prescriptives and prescriptors and descriptors that I give of everybody else. Like that was something that I just was like, I really on this, on this quest and journey for me to have a much more holistic and authentic relationship with the divine. I wanted a way to talk about God that was exclusively about God. Yeah. And that was beautifully holy and divine for me to honor that God stands above and beyond language, that that our ability to ascribe gender to God really reflects the failings of human language. It reflects that we don't have (laughs) the capacities to talk about God in different ways. And I just, I, I really, I really wanted to, I really wanted to speak to the way that some of us may be groaning and, and longing for a, a much more holy, divine conversation, ability to describe God and, and realizing that for a lot of us, the first steps towards that we're detaching God from a, from a, any kind of gender. You know what you just made me think of, uh, and I, I disagree with a little something that you said just a little bit. You said we mm-hmm. don't have the language. And I thought about, well, who has come closest to having the language? And there are certain poets, well, I'm getting chills just thinking about it, um, that have come closest to articulating how what God sees and that that mm. fullness and glory of God, um, Pope, well, Maya Angelou comes to mind, of course, uh, but Walt Whitman also comes to mind. These two um, poets in particular would not be approved, <laughs> you know. I mean, Whitman mm. um, was gay, and and, and Maya yeah. Angelou's life story uh, certainly, you know, um, th- there's a lot that that maybe a bunch of our friends from church would want to try to hide, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. respectable society, if you will, but man, their work just really resonates. I think there's an element to their work and, and, and you actually talk about it uh, in, in the book, later, a later chapter, you speak, here it is, um, pretty extensively and beautifully about grace. Uh, mm-hmm. Here's the quote. Um, you say, grace doesn't blind us to who we have been or shield us from taking accountability for the pain we cause, but it provides us with second, third, fourth, and hundredth chances to become better people. Um, You go on and you say, grace is generous. And when we lean into it, we can't help but extend it to others. The lens of grace enabled me to recognize the brokenness of others, even when they didn't see it in themselves. And when we're talking about this stuff, this is hard stuff, race Mm -hmm. and gender and just you know, mental health. Um, yeah, it, it seems, but it seems like grace is the thing that we forget first, isn't it? 
I not only forget, but can sometimes wholly reject when it's in our faces. Grace is someone. <laughs> Someone asked me, they were, they asked me, they said, if you had to live without one of these things, grace or love, which one would you pick? And I was like, oh my God, that's so not fair. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I, and I told them, I said, while I don't, I was like, I think that the, I think that those, and I'm going to tell you the same thing I told them. I was like, first, I think questions like that are exercises in futility. Like, that does not matter. Because um, I'm not going to ever live a life without either. So, like, and why would I want to? Yeah. Um, but, and at the same time, I told him, I said, to even position it in that way speaks to a profound miscalculation or misunderstanding of grace and how it moves in our life that we could ever think that we are without it um, that we could that we could ever think that it is possible to live lives that have not in some way shape or form been touched by grace daily and i i think too often we don't make room for even greater capacities of grace. Yeah. I think they make us like I my prayer often is that I am made more gracious. My prayer is that my heart is always turned and tuned to grace even when and even if it means that I still am no longer in relationship with somebody mm. or no longer connected to somebody. Like, I mean, I write about, even though like there's a, a chapter that is specifically about grace context and like a dumb thing that I did. I talk about grace when it comes to my father. I believe that even how I wrote about him, even how I wrote about a lot of people in the book reflects a commitment to seeing them through the lens of grace, even as they have, even as they've done, done harm to me, right? Even the ways that I hold myself accountable in the book is me kind of modeling a critical graciousness of myself. You know, I can't hold the church accountable for its harms and I'm not be honest about the way that I've done the same, right? And at the same time, the same ways that I know that the church is able to be better is because I know that I have been given the capacity to be better. And so I don't like, grace becomes this, we're just talking about the 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 fealties of the human language because now I'm literally <laughs> stuck with the word. But grace becomes this illuminating force in my life that gets me so excited about chances to be better, right? Because the chances to be better are because grace was extended to us, right? Like that, you know, and I push back on, I push back on, I mean, I push back on Paul with a lot of stuff. But then Paul's like, you know, okay, so why y'all, why y'all send so grace can abound? Like, why y'all out here doing stuff so that you can be forgiven? So that you, and I'm like, yeah, I get that. And we probably should not, <laughs> um, we should always strive to do our best. And yet, the the fact that my worst moment does not have to define me, and that my worst moment is not the only moment that I have in my life, like that. Um, my mama used to say it. My mom used to say it like this. I'm gonna mess it up. I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna try to paraphrase it as best she could, okay. um, as best I could. 
But my mom would tell me, even if you, even if someone loses their life in the midst of the worst decision that they have ever made, that last moment never defined the totality of their life. Mm. And I used to think that that was the most profound thing because so many people would always harp on the worst thing. Mm -hmm. Or if someone died and it was, you know, like, I hate, like, I mean, too often I'm learning, we're hearing about people who died of gun violence. Yeah. And being in the quote unquote wrong place at the wrong time and 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 the ways that people would talk about if they were there, if they were somewhere else, this wouldn't have happened. And there's room to grieve the loss of that life. For sure. And that one moment does not define an entire life, you know, that there was joy, there was care, there was love. That is grace. Right. That is grace. And I want to, I hope that it was conveyed in the book that we live lives that are full of grace, even when we don't see it, even when we reject it. And if it's going to be there, because it already is, we may as well open ourselves up to how we may as well open ourselves up to its presence and the ways that we can be radically changed and transformed because of it. Yeah. You know, uh, I usually don't bring up uh, daily headlines, but, but <laughs> something, something is relevant to a lot of what we're talking about. The, the public reaction to what Whoopi Goldberg said on The View. Oh, wow. Yeah. I, I was curious. So I, let me just reset it for those. Um, I'll read the top kind of story summary. Whoopi Goldberg, the comedian actress who is this is uh, from The New York Times, who is also a co-host of the ABC talk show, The View, will be suspended for two weeks. The network announced Tuesday night after she said repeatedly during an episode of the show that aired on Monday that the Holocaust was not about race. So I, I have I have conflicting thoughts about this. The public reaction to her has been largely uh, lacking of grace. But ha having, uh, I, I grew up in an observant Jewish family, one generation removed from family members who died in the Holocaust. My grandparents' generation suffered through and fled the pogroms of Russia. So I, I definitely have thoughts about this. But I was curious what your reaction is to how this all played out. Yeah, um, I will. Let me let me first say this. I am very sensitive to any calls that hold us accountable for anti-Semitic remarks and anti-Semitism. I believe that all oppression is linked, even, in, even if it is manifested differently in various communities, that it is about power and that it is about the, like I said earlier, the ability to withhold and deny humanity and dignity to certain communities. I had a life-changing experience in 2019, thanks to the AJC here in the US, when they invited me to spend seven days, I think it's seven or 10, I can't remember, days in Israel as a part of their first delegation of religious writers and speakers. That trip fundamentally changed my life. And I got to sit and hear from Jewish people about their experiences and the ways, and including Holocaust survivors, about the ways that they wish that we would speak to this instance, to this, to their experience and speak, speak about it with care, reverence, and respect. When it comes to what she said, I honestly felt like she was trying to speak to a larger issue of the fact that the Holocaust was evil and that maybe having a conversation about it along issues of race and racial lens 
is not helpful. I understand that because I have a grandmother who's 87 who was very adamant that she did not feel like Whoopi said anything incorrect. She was like, because for her, she was like, these are two groups of white people that were oppressing each other. This is about evil. And having to explain to her, well, like, you know, religion, I mean, Jewish, Jewish identity is both religious and it's ethnic. And that, you know, have, having to explain that to her. And she still was like, mm, you know, she's 87. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, okay. You know, she's like, wrong is wrong. And what happened is wrong. And everybody that's a part of it needed to have gone to jail. And they're probably not going to heaven. Like, that's literally what she said. Okay. And so, and that is, that's where she lands. I am able because of access to education to have and, and experiences to have a different kind of nuanced conversation. What hurt and what was disappointing was that I felt like there was no room to honor the spirit of what I felt like Whoopi was trying to say. Like, and I think when, like, I, when I think, I think when we you know, I think when we hear, when we, because I watched it several times. Yeah. Like, this was not a denial of. of Wait, the, you, like, you can't tell me that you're surprised that there's no room for nuance in our conversations. <laughs> yeah. <right. Come> on. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, you know, it just, it was this moment where I was like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Like, she didn't deny. Yeah. The existence of the Holocaust. Um, which I think is and continues to be one of the greatest acts of anti-Semitism that is per- the fact that you have people who are saying that it actually didn't happen is dangerous, like fundamentally dangerous. That's not what she said. You know, she spoke to this being about man's inhumanity to man, which is true. And so is it possible? And I and I really looked for and longed for people who in the right spaces who could have said what she said was true. And we need to have a conversation about the ways that Jewish identity is both religious and ethnic. Yeah. That that this that in many ways, yes, this was about race. This was and is about a kind of ethnic cleansing. Like this, that the Holocaust is was evil. It was about man's inhumanity to man, and it was about race. And when we remove race from this conversation, even unknowingly we go, we, we find ourselves on a very slippery slope, right? To the erasure of identity in ways that are profoundly harmful, right? Um, that is a teachable moment. And I hate that we are not in, that we've moved out of, and um, this is definitely going off, what I'm about to say, going off course, um, but I'm actually writing about it, you know, in a lot of ways for the next book. But I'm I really hate the ways that cancel culture, which has always been about holding the powerful accountable for the harms and the ways that they victimize those that they deem as powerless. I really am grieved by the way that cancel culture has now morphed into ways that grace does not abound for those of us who are who are are honestly and intentionally trying to get it right. Yeah. You know, to me that was that was a moment where grace could have abounded. That is a very different moment than, you know, when you had people who say stuff like the Jews have bought up all of Black America 
and you know um the jews were in hollywood you know the holocaust isn't it wasn't real it was all fabricated and who doubled down on that that's a very to me that feels very different yeah and when you have a black woman who has experienced and continues to experience the kinds of anti-blackness and the gendered oppression the intersectional oppression that Whoopi does, you also have a moment where you should be able to hear her heart. And and in that moment, I did. I knew exactly what she was trying to say. Did it come out in a way that others would hope? No. But but what mat what matters more? And I and I think in this instance, not in all instances, believe me. But I do think that this was an instance where the spirit of what she was trying to say should have have given way to a, a to better, more nuanced conversation versus versus a suspension. Yeah, well, I, I won't get into I, I, too deep of my thoughts on that. I, I think you and I are aligned in that grace was lacking in that. Mm -hmm. a lot of the reaction but also if there's one thing i am grateful for is that this whole incident has brought to the surface certain conversations that i think are worth having yeah but uh we're, we're quickly running out of time here so uh i'm gonna jump so i feel like this means that you've got to call me back for a part two like i just i feel like that has to happen at this point <laughs> Because I didn't even know that we were at time. <laughs> oh, that's good. That's good. Well, I can't even tell you how much of my questions I just dropped. I'm like, oh, man, we're already 45 minutes an hour. In. Like, there's all these. Well, I didn't even ask you my sex question. Holy cow. Uh, <laughs> that's for that's for our subscriber section. Our five, like, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. OK, so so I'll just ask a few more questions. And one is, do you have any questions for me? I do. Uh oh, okay. I want. <laughs> I, the main question that I have for you is how would you describe God? Oh boy. So I came to two very important, irreducible, completely verifiable conclusions, but only verifiable to me. I mm. did a lot of study, a lot of thinking, even since I was a little boy, I was thinking on big questions about God. But those two conclusions that I came to that were irreducible and completely verifiable are that there is a God, number one. Mm. And number two, I am not God. Oh, so the character of God at a certain point, you know, beyond those irreducible things, I, I have to begin to defer to what I think is transcendent wisdom. Mm -hmm. I find a lot of that in scripture. So what, what is the character of God? I'll tell you, you know, so having grown up very observantly Jewish, going to an Orthodox synagogue, what was one of the biggest uh, things that, that just shook my, shook me to the core was reading what I thought of as the Devar Torah, starting in Matthew five, that Jesus gave the, the Sermon on the Mount, mm -hmm. just brilliant transcendent wisdom so to begin and then the parables that he uses to describe god from all different kinds of angles you know so mm. what are some of those characteristics i do think that god is sovereign good mm -hmm. uh knowing i mean it, it's the very frame of reference for what is good Mm. And we certainly have some revelation and a lot of revelation in scripture. We have revelation in creation. Mm. We have revelation mm. in little creation, you know, like I just, I was telling somebody yesterday, somebody asked me what my favorite sound is. And it's Louis Armstrong's note that he blows at the end of La Vie en Rose, that impossible note that he hits, mm -hmm. you know, but if you listen to, I was driving my daughter up from, uh, a party when she was in high school and um, Ella Fitzgerald's uh, she had a live rendition of how high the moon came on. And mm. uh, my daughter knew every note. She was singing every note with her syllable for syllable. 
And at that moment, I knew there is a God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that answers your question directly, but that's what comes mm -hmm. to mind. That answered it. And that actually gives me chills. Like, I think what has resonated with me the most as people engage me about and engage with me about relative theology has been their descriptions of God. Because I, I think, and I talk about this in the book, I think God has to be that personal to us. Like, because when you are, when you are going through things, when, when storms are the heaviest that they are in your life, or when things are just com completely make sense and God feels far away, it's the moments like the car and, and, and your daughter. It's the moments of like when I am with uh, my little cousins and they laugh. Like I may not remember that moment in that specific moment when I'm going through, but the memory that God is that close and near to me and that God is present. It sticks with me and as it sticks with me I'm able to I'm able to push in a, in a way and move forward in a way that I think is is sustaining and even more life-giving so yeah that's why I asked it because I, I I think God has to be that personal and I'm always excited about because I get something different like one uh, guy said to me that his that God for him, after a long day in school, that he all he wanted was a peanut butter and jelly sandwich with the crust cut off. <laughs> and I mean, he was so hungry. He was so hungry. And that was all he wanted. And he came home and his mom had it and she had it cut out in a heart for him with a glass of milk. And he said, as he ate it, he, I forgot how old he was, but it was like, he was a kid kid and he still remembered it. Yeah. He said, as he ate it, his mama just played in his hair. And he was like, I, he said, anytime somebody asks me about God, that's the first memory that comes to me. Oh man. And I'm like that, like God has to be that personal to us because God is that personal to us. Yeah, well, I think it was Heschel that talked a lot about the sanctity in the mundane. It's mm -hmm. the peanut butter sandwiches. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's so, the peanut butter sandwiches. Yeah. So tell us about the Louise Marie Foundation. Yeah, so I'm really excited. Uh, we established the Louise Marie Foundation uh, last year um, and are in the process of getting our 501c3 status. But the... The, the, the two things that my mother loved the most and were most important to her were faith and education. And um, she, at the time of her death, was both a mental health nurse practitioner as well as a professor of nursing at her alma mater, Winston-Salem State University. And so what the Louise Marie Foundation does um, we had been doing it um, for such a long time, and now we get to, to institutionalize it in a way, is to provide support in the same ways that my mom was. What my mom found with her students was that they could find a way to pay for school, but then they didn't have money for books. <laughs> and then once they got to the end of paying for all of their fees, they weren't able to pay for the test, the NCLEX exam that they needed or the study guides that they needed for the NCLEX exam. And so what the Louise Marie Foundation does is we provide resources to help students pay for their exams, pay for study materials, and also pay for those additional nursing fees that come up uh, during the semester that um, are not covered by uh, scholarships, as well as working with uh, organizations in the community to also help to do community to do community micro grants for mental health programs. And so 
it was my way and is my way of honoring the work that both of us do to one, um, propel and prepare the next generation of Black healthcare providers, but to also continue to make inroads in conversations around faith and mental health. And so people can go to uh, my website, Candace Bimbo, and they can get more information about it. But I'm really excited because this year um, we get to do much more institutionally around it in a way that we've been doing just on our own. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I, I will ask this again, but just so I have it handy. Candace Benbo and, and B as in boy, E-N as in Nancy, B-O-W is the last name. Candice, C-A-N-D-I-C-E, Benbo.com. There's a lot yep. of great stuff on there. But how else can we find more information about you, the, the new book, Red Lip Theology, and all the great work yeah. that you're doing? So um, you can find me on the socials at, uh, at Candice Bimbo. So um, Twitter and Instagram, my handle is my name, Candice Bimbo. I am the daily uh, lifestyle education and health writer at the Grio. So every day you can find me writing about something, a lifestyle education and health related at the Grio, um, the Grio.com. So those are the primary ways. And, you know, you can get the book wherever books are sold. And I'm just really grateful and excited and thankful for the reception that I've gotten so far. And um, thank you for a conversation that I, I needed today. So, oh, good. Good. Yeah, this was beautiful. Thank you. I was so glad that that Jay pointed me in your direction. I got so much from the book and it's, it's provoking thoughts and count me as, as one more fan of, of many, I'm sure. Thank you so much. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much to me. Thank you. Good, good. And as always, if you dig what we're doing here, please hit that subscribe button, leave a review and comments wherever you get your podcasts. Tell a friend about TPNR. We're easier to recommend than ever. It's politics and religion. Us. That's politics and religion. Us. And you can even support our program through the patron app on our site. Now go talk some politics and religion with gentleness and respect and have a great week. Thank you for joining us today. If you dig what we're doing here, it is super easy to follow us. You can go to our site, politicsandreligion.us. That's with the and spelled out, A-N-D. Politicsandreligion.us. And we're on all the socials, at TP and R pod. You know, TP and R pod for talking politics and religion pod. And here's a big way you can support us, by becoming one of our patrons. You can even become a producer or executive producer of our program and have a lot more say in who we bring on, the kinds of questions we explore, or just help us keep the lights on. But mostly, we really appreciate you giving us a listen. So for the whole team here at Talking Politics and Religion Without Killing Each Other, thanks for hanging out with us. We'll be back in a few days to do our little part in Tikkun Olam. Thank you.